Hey guys, I'm Perry Nemiroff, and I am so, so excited to be here today with the director and star of Green Room. We have Jeremy Saulnier. Did I get the accent right? Perfect. I've been I've been having a little bit of a hard time with the accent. And Anton Yelchin. The accent was weird on mine. Yeah? Right? Yeah, a little weird. How, how yeah. would you prefer to pronounce it? Anton Yelchin. <laughs> Glad I got it then. Yeah, yeah. So I saw, I was telling you guys before, I saw this movie at TIFF, and I absolutely loved it. I think it was actually the only A rating I gave out last year, or maybe oh, wow. one of two. I'm like a little Flatter. sensitive when it comes to giving like A's or perfect scores, because I don't know, how can you call a movie perfect? But clearly I did it with yours, and I absolutely loved it. Too kind. Out of curiosity, at this point, how many times have you guys been asked to give your Desert Island band? About 1,100. Does it's your, Black Sabbath, just you so you cheat? know. Does your answer change? It no, changed once to Talking did Heads. Did it? Oh, it was the day. Weird. It was the day. I wasn't there. I'm glad I wasn't there. It's Black Sabbath, though. I'm going to be super different and ask for your Desert Island movie, then. Yeah. Oh, actually, we have been asked. Ah, I like it. that one, though. I like that one, because I can actually answer that one. What is it? Taxi Driver. That is so 1990s college student. <laughs> I had that too. I'd say, well, this is going to be a, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh, you said that Ooh, last Oh, that's time. a good yeah, one. Good. I feel it's, like Taxi Driver would drive me nuts after a while, like being secluded on it a desert island. It has driven me island. nuts. That's why I am the way I am. I started yeah. watching it when I was like 12. I think that's what it's yeah. meant to do. Yeah, that's right. And so, I used that for Green Room. So how do you get to this from Blue Ruin? Does someone see a movie like Blue Ruin and say, you know, that movie's awesome. Let's let this guy do whatever he wants next. To some extent, I mean, I definitely capitalized off the momentum from Blue Ruin, but I actually was expected to kind of try and latch on to bigger projects, um, like on some ensemble crime thing that was more elevated. Um, but I had this thing in me, this this idea for Green Room that was been haunting me for like it predates Blue Ruin actually, and I figured that I really owed it to myself to to to, to get this one in. Uh, before I tried to do the next studio project or whatever, whatever lofty project, I was like, let me go back to my aggro days back in the hardcore punk scene and make a film that, that I, I thought would be perfect for myself when I was 18, 19 years old, like making movies in my backyard with my friends and going to punk shows. Like this is, this is my perfect film when I was a teenager. And you played too, you're singing. Uh, I couldn't play. That, all right, all right. I, I was a yeller. I was a yeller <laughs> a in a yeller. hardcore band because I couldn't play. I would annoy my drummer, James Barnes. Um, uh, he's, he's an amazing drummer. And whenever he would get up for a break, I would, I would go behind and sit on the kit and fiddle faddle, which is really annoying. But I've always wanted to play drums, so one day I will. But in, until until then, it's just yelling. And you've got music history too, right? You knew how to play a little bit. A little bit, yeah. I had I had like a crusty, crusty sort of garage punk band a little bit ago. Um, so a little bit, yeah. No, what you was play it it, He plays it down. I heard him yesterday. They're awesome. They're punk. They're yeah, cool. we're just like a crusty punk band. Yeah. I, my friends are really good musicians. Like they're all really, really good. So I'd be the one that always would have to play catch up and like. And what do you play? You play you play bass, right? I play I play bass now actually. Like I'm learning to play bass after this film, but I would just play guitar. But I like bass a lot actually. They were the Hammerheads, just so. You hammerheads. Yep. Yeah. Where did the title uh, "Ain't Rights" come from? A real band, actually, good friends of mine, uh, a former member of my hardcore band still plays in, in lots of different bands in New York City. And and, and, and some, some friends of mine had a, had a ba band called The Ain't Rights and they kind of dissolved about a year ago. So I was like, let me just appropriate that name and uh, put it on screen. Do you have to go to them and be like, can I have the rights to your band name? I mean, this movie's gonna be a they never had a and record they're gonna come back to you. Yeah, well, no, they're, they're all friends. So go ahead, sue you me. You think no. so now. And there's, yeah. there, there's no contracts or anything. <laughs> Uh, they were just like a band that played about four or five shows. <laughs> what about the movies you used to make before you were actually making these big features? What kind of movies? Like, you mean in my in backyard? In your backyard, In my yeah. backyard? Well, it started off with photography. I, I was big into fine scale modeling. Um, I would have, I would build dioramas and photograph them and try and recreate these scenes. Whether they be AT-ATs or G.I. Joe figures. Or, or custom built airplanes, whatever it was, I, I, I got into it because of movie magic. I was watching Godzilla flicks on the, uh, Captain 20 WDCA every Sunday in, in, in Washington, DC. It was a Godzilla flick, you know, some kind of creature feature. Um, and I just, I, I wanted to know how to do that. So I, I would take things in my backyard, I would experiment with special effects and, and 
blow shit up and set things on fire. You know, can't do that anymore. But um, it was very tactile. It was like I wanted to get out and, and, and move the camera and, and get dirty and, and have fun. So it, it was a lot of a lot of violence. Do but these <laughs> exist anywhere? Can I watch one of these? There's, you know, on Murder Party, our first film, there's actually not, not that, but we have our first film, The Collective, that, that I was part of, uh, Mega Cop, very much inspired by uh, sort of Michael Mann, Miami Vice stuff. It's like a cartel story. A cop is avenging the death of his partner, um, takes down the cartel. Sanchez. I need to check that out. Sanchez. It's really, it's it's it's, awesome. it's really pure. It's great. I mean, it's got temper, tempera paint in in uh, Ziploc bags for the blood packs. You know, it's really old school. And uh, we actually did a, a sequel, Mega Cop 2000. Mm-hmm. What uh, a brilliant title. Yeah, and this is back, this is the 90s, so it was a big deal. <laughs> but um, it never got finished. One day I will finish Mega Cop 2000 and present it in all its glory. So now you've got the music background. How about the supremacist angle of the movie? Do you do a lot of research? Because it's a fictional story, but I imagine some of this behavior might have come from real things. Well, sure. I mean, when I was in the hardcore scene in D.C. back in the 1990s, there were actually Nazi skinheads at every show, just about. I mean, this is like odd for a 16-year-old to go across the bridge from Alexandria, Virginia into D.C. and see Nazis in broad daylight at a matinee show. Um, and I was a little scared. You know, I was off put by that, and it stayed with me. Um, and, and of course, the ideology of, of these Nazi skinheads is is part of their culture. But I pick them primarily because they are the most like soldiers within the punk rock hardcore scene. And what I was making was a sort of a punk horror uh, war movie. You know, it is like. Um, the Ain't Rights is fictional band. They're out of their depth. They're amateurs. They're trapped in the green room. And I wanted adversaries that would, would be the most like soldiers. And skinheads are organized. They wear uniforms. I mean, they wear combat boots, surplus gear. Um, and they have, they're part of a, a bigger, larger punk rock hardcore culture, yet they're very separate. And they have extreme views, which lend themselves to militancy. So they're soldiers, pretty much. And, that's, and I steered clear of monologues about ideology and hate um, and, and just kept them to the, the war at hand. Oh, for sure. It feels really natural in that respect and also in terms of the decisions the characters make. Whether they're the good guys or the bad guys, mm-hmm. everything feels kind of naturally impulsive and like a decision any normal person would make given this yeah. kind of situation, which yeah. is a really smart move. Well, thank you. I mean, it's <laughs> all about procedure, too, and tactics. I mean, I think the films I make are often like could be described as the clay room floor of an action movie for mm-hmm. the, the Hollywood types. I mean, it's all how do we get to from, from A to B to C, like every little step I want to see it. I don't want to cut just to the let's get to the get to the plot. Like the, my plot is in detail. It's it's artifacts and, and, and props and and really mining a, uh, a location, in this case, a crusty like punk rock venue in the middle of nowhere you know for all it's all it's uh, has to offer you know anton can you tell me about your casting a little bit what do you do (laughs) in an audition for something like this do you have to play music and just be scared and terrorized the entire time uh i don't know it was pretty straightforward i ended up meeting with jeremy sort of around the time that i thought i was going to be in it and i ended up reading one scene for him because i know that you know, I, I, I always think, like, meeting people is great and, like, anyone can sort of BS around, but, like, you kind of have to just show a person that this is what you're going to do so they feel comfortable that you're going to, like, be in their film. I think that's the almost honest and straightforward way to, like, build a good relationship with someone. So I remember I flew out to Portland and we read one of the scenes in the film. And, and, and yeah, I don't know that, like, being in a band really factored into it much. I think it was cool. Like, I'm glad that I could relate to that and mostly to relate to the fact that, like, the joy of sharing this kind of music with your friends and with an audience. Like, I, that that helped me, you know, because that's it's, it's such a joyous time and it's a joyous time in my life. Um, but I think, I don't know, I, I feel like, I don't know, maybe you got me for my shredding skills, you know? Oh, yeah. I, I was uh, scouting I the hammerheads <laughs> yeah. know, at, at the, the Viper Room. I like the Sunday, Yngwie Malmsteen Sunday at midnight, of the 818. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about uh, Patrick Stewart? Because obviously everybody loves him and we all want to talk about him. And he's, the he's so perfect in this movie, too. Did you have him in mind when you wrote the role? No, I mean, I, I would never presume you know, hmm. as, as an indie filmmaker writing this kind of aggressive punk rock genre movie um, 
that he would stoop to our level, you know, well, come on. Um, you know, and I didn't write with, I wrote with real people in mind because you know, there's a real Tad, there's a real Tiger, there's a real Pat. Um, uh, these these are people that 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 I knew growing growing up, and I almost want to see a behind the scenes documentary like with that perspective now. If I had more time, I mean, actually, uh, we're gonna go do a sneak preview in Washington D.C., and and half half the, the the people I base the movie on are gonna be there. It's gonna be wonderful. Um, but as far as like Patrick Stewart, you know, I, I wrote I wrote the character Darcy um, just as a fictional character. Again, I, I don't want to get anything too baked into my vision because going through the process of casting is. is is pretty tough. I mean, it's just managing schedules and, and, and negotiations. It's crazy. Um, and we were actually in a, in a, in a, in a tight squeeze. We were, at, uh, I think, 10 days out from production with no Darcy. And I thought the whole film was going to implode. I mean, the, the, the young cast, you know, Anton, the 25 and under crowd were just like fighting to get into this film because it's such a rare opportunity for them. Like, I didn't cast a bunch of like beefcake. You know, it was like, people who are often like in the sort of indie darling uh, categor ca categorization or like girlfriends or boyfriends in movies got to be helming this insane violent action movie. So they, they had a ball. But Patrick just had joined my, my management company and happened to be looking for something new and different. And an assistant at that company just handed the script over and suggested it. And he responded to the script and watched my previous film, Blue Ruin. and. We were on the phone, and then all of a sudden, he was in Portland. It was insane. And I never asked him why, because I didn't want to plant the seed of doubt. Mm -hmm. you know, I was like, just sign the deal. Let's go. Let's go. And then we had to shoot his finale first and get to know each other after that and, and sort of back out of that and, and build his character again from the beginning. It was, it, was, it was tough, but, man, he was such a dedicated actor like anybody else on set, and it was very comforting, you know. Now, I don't want to spoil anything, but I'm a big fan of blood and guts and gore. So I wanted to ask you, one, what was the most <coughs> difficult gore sequence action set piece to pull off? And two, was anything kind of pushing the limits in terms of audience tolerance or the R rating? Yeah, I mean, luckily the MPAA, I think, respected the fact that, you know, the body count in this movie is relatively low and that the violence had an extreme emotional impact. I mean, it's certainly... There's a makeup show there, but it, it, you know I think feeling the, the loss of life and, and having it be somewhat devastating from time to time is more responsible than killing a whole, a whole like city of people and not blinking. Um, but I also those films that I made in the backyard when I was in in the mid '80s, they were about that tactile interface, and I, I've always loved and appreciated makeup effects like Rob Bottin and Rick Baker. Um, that's what I love to do every Halloween. Like, and I was, I was in, in 11th grade, I was doing advanced prosthetics and tubing and engineering. Um, so actually the makeup effects for me in, in this, in this great design and, and onset, you know, makeup team was easy. I love it. I know how to shoot it. I've been doing it for 30 years. Um, and the lesson I learned though is, is, uh, you know, with amazing prosthetics and blood pumping and everything working out. Uh, you had the, the the perfect sort of practical makeup effects, but the performance is what sold it. And, and I think the best lesson with that is there when the film shifts and all of a sudden you feel like this is not what I expected, this is going to end very poorly. Uh, people are reeling from it. Is is when when Anton encounters um, some machetes uh, outside of a door, and his friends pull him back in, and that that was an amazing thing because. It wasn't quite sold. Uh, we had everything in place, and it was all practical. But Anton was a bit inflexible, <laughs> right? So this is not very disgusting. Like, ouch, ouch. And we went through a physical process where he would stretch his wrist. Yeah, for, for Jeremy's like, you need to go home, and you'd be stretching your wrist, yeah. and you'd be doing this a lot. And yeah. I was like, and the, oh, all that's right. gross. <laughs> Well, it definitely worked. That yeah. scene in particular kind yeah. of sets the tone for, you know, yeah. the bulk of the movie. And it's horrifying and it's real and it's because of everything coming together. It's 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 the stunts, it's the makeup, it's the performance and that that, that was the big lesson. I hate to switch topics cuz I'm so obsessed with this movie, but we have a lot of big Star Trek fans too, so I wanted to ask after 3 films of playing this character, is there anything about Chekhov that kind of started to feel more your own? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think uh, it's funny because on this one, it's, it's been an interesting journey because I, I did 
green room um and that was one particular kind of character and then i went to my friend uh, gabe Klinger's film it was very very different weird character that aged from like my age to his 60s and then i went to star trek and i just i tend to just think of things as, as characters you know um uh you know and then i think for me I, when I work with actors, like one of the things that you know, I love working with Emmy again is because Emmy's really creative. She's a really creative actor, and I think in recent years that's what interests me. So, like anything I can pull out of, you know, sort of pull out of it and come up with, I, I tried to tend to apply. And that's whether it's you know, Green Room or like I said, my friend Gabe Klinger's film or Star Trek. It's all sort of same thing. Like, how creative can you be? What can you borrow from? Like, what can you? What have you learned? Like, what have I learned since the last one we made that I can use now? Is there anything in particular that you've learned from those past two films that you thought, like, I need to take this for number three? I don't know. I, I don't know, really. I just like watching the old show and, like, I think um, just coming up with stuff. I think, like, uh, I think that for me, the most beautiful performances are the ones that are kind of imperfect, where someone, like, tries something and it's a little out and weird and, like, I like that, you know, and I think... Um, I think I, I, the actors I'm most inspired by are like that, and there's a lot of that back in the day. Like James Cagney's like that, like things he does are just like, but then, but then they're kind of brilliant, you know. Well, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm excited for that. I thank am you. insanely excited for this. Again, like so A rating. Much. I adore this movie, which is probably not the way to describe it, but like I love horror, so I adore it. I will watch it over and over again. Anton Jeremy, thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for having us. Please, please go see Green Room limited release on April 15th, then it's going everywhere on April 29th. Thank you for watching. Again, thank you for being here, and we'll see you next time. Our pleasure. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.